हेलो गाइस हाउ आर यू आई एम हरदीप सिंह वेलकम बैक टू योर ओन यूट्यूब चैनल आल्स अपडेट्स एंड रीसेंट एग्जाम्स फॉर मोर अपडेट्स रिलेटेड टू रीसेंट आल्स एग्जाम राइटिंग दस टॉपिक्स लिस्टनिंग रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट एंड स्पीकिंग क्यू कैट गेस वर्क प्लीज गाइस पार्टिसिपेट इन एवरी डे लिस्टनिंग एंड रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट टू अचीव योर डिजायर बैंड स्कोर इन योर एक्चुअल आल्स एग्जाम Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page Alts Updates and Recent Exams. You will hear a conversation between a printing company employee and a customer. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good afternoon. Welcome to Matrix Printing. I'm John Smith. How can I help you? Good afternoon. I'm here to reprint a brochure for our hotel. There are some pages that need revising. Sure. How may I address you? Oh, I'm Mary Jane from Central Hotel Chains. Nice to meet you. I've got samples of the previous version. I assume it is your company's advertising brochure. Yes. What exactly is the problem? Well, it was printed the year before, so some of the information is already out of date. There are also a couple of problems with the layout. Firstly, the letters of the address on the front page are far too small. It's hard to see when glancing at the cover. How big do you need it to be? Increase the letters by 3 font sizes. Just a minute. Let me take notes of your requirements. Okay. What else needs changing? The information regarding the pool should be deleted because it is currently under renovation and is not available. So, all of the relevant descriptions on page 2 should be removed. What do we replace it with? We can't just leave the whole page blank. Just fill it in with the introduction of our newly opened gym. I've included all the relevant information here in this flash drive. Let me check. Um, I see. No problem then. What is also bothering us is that the description under the top photos on page 4 is incorrect. The word lounge needs to be replaced with reception. Fully noted. Is that all? No, there is more. Turn to page 5. We feel that showing merely the picture of our exterior and interior decoration does not fully represent the appeal of our hotel. On second thought, we've decided to use a picture with the view of the hotel. Do you have the original copy of the picture? Yes, it is also enclosed in the flash drive. Okay. We'll re-edit the whole layout of the photos. Great. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Let's turn to the next page. Yes. What's wrong with that? It seems perfectly fine to me. At first sight it seems fine, but according to the feedback of the customers, the prices do not stand out. So, we want to change the print from black to red to make it pop out. Okay, I've made notes of all of your requests. Is there anything else? I appreciate it. Just one final request. Could you translate the whole brochure into Spanish? We have customers worldwide, you know, especially those from Latin countries. No problem. 
What about other languages, like Japanese, Chinese or German? These are our most popular target languages. I have to ask the manager about the Chinese version. There's been a surging number of Chinese clients during recent years. However, we don't need German or Japanese translations, as we currently don't have many customers from those two countries. Sure. Just keep me updated. So, roughly, when could we get the revised print? We need it before the end of July. It's late June now. Roughly, it'll take three weeks to re-edit. So it will definitely be ready before the deadline. Great. To where shall we send the samples? The address is number 9 Green Drive, Clifton, NY21300. How do you spell Clifton? C-L-I-F-F-T-O-N, Clifton. And the telephone number? It's 9030366022. Also, if you have any further questions, you can reach me through this number. OK. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear a talk about the history of a poetry award. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 15. Hello everyone, and welcome to this year's award ceremony for the Antonia Watson Memorial Poetry Award. As with previous years, the competition has been particularly fierce and we received numerous excellent entries, so it's an incredible achievement for our three finalists who are sitting here amongst you, and we should congratulate them all. However, as with every competition, there can unfortunately only be one winner, and we will be announcing them shortly. Before we do, though, a few words about the award itself. As most of you know, the Antonia Watson Memorial Poetry Award has been presented annually since 2010 and was presented biannually for two more competitions prior, once in 2008 and once in 2006. It is entirely funded by Antonia Watson's very generous parents who offer £1,500 to the author of the best poem on a topic announced at each previous award ceremony, as well as £500 to the first runner-up and £250 to the second, bringing the total up to £2,250. Now, a few words on Antonia Watson herself, without whom none of us would be standing here today. I briefly knew Antonia while at university, where we were flatmates for a year, and I'm afraid that any speech I give will not be able to do her justice, as she was the kindest, sweetest person I've ever met. Thankfully, this part of my speech was written with the assistance of one of her siblings, Thomas Watson, who was not only her brother, but also her best friend. Antonia was born in Slayford, Lincolnshire, in December 1986. From a very young age, she displayed an inquisitive and creative nature, matched in volume only by the gentle kindness of her spirit. She wrote her first poem, named Love Barks, about the death of her dog at the age of ten. This was also her first poem to be published at her school's newspaper, just two months after another of her poems, Be Kind, won the 1996 Triad Children's Writing Competition and was published in the competition's anthology. While her early forays into poetry were crowned with impressive success, Antonia unfortunately ceased to write for a few years following the death of her very dear grandfather, Peter William Watson, in 1999.
You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 16 to 18. Despite her writer's block, however, her artistic nature didn't lie dormant during the next four years. She had an active role in various theatre plays, and she also ventured into painting. A few of the plays are available on the internet, and you can find several of her self-portraits on our website, and you can see for yourself how impressive they are. But poetry, of course, remained her passion even then, which is why in 2003 she resumed writing and her next poem, The War on Both Sides, was published in her college's journal. At the age of 18, Antonia moved to Sheffield to study English literature at the University of Sheffield. This is where she and I met, spending a whole year in adjacent rooms in a flat in central Sheffield. This is also where I met her good-natured, generous parents, Mr and Mrs Watson, who came to visit her regularly and always treated me like a daughter as well. Antonia and I grew very close during that period, and while we ran in different circles, we always found time for each other every week. Antonia self-published one collection of poems in August 2005. It was named Burning Stars, after the poem on page 16, which is also the date of her birthday. It was an immediate success amongst her peers at the University of Sheffield, and it was so cherished by her English literature classmates specifically that it had attracted the attention of one of her lecturers, who put her in touch with a literary agent. She had been due to begin working on her second collection right before her tragic passing in a car accident just five days before her 19th birthday in December 2005. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 19 to 20. Antonia was always interested in societal shifts and how they affect humanity as well as the environment, and this award was designed to reflect her faith that regardless of what we do, we are all inherently good. With this in mind, all of the topics this competition has dealt with have been about the potential and the positive side of humanity, such as this year's Young Love theme or last year's Inner Power theme. We've had poems about personal strength, about immigration, about gender equality and peaceful protest. And hopefully in 12 months, the poems we'll be awarding will be just as inspiring with the topic of poverty. I know Antonia would be really proud of what her parents and what all of you together have achieved. So, finally, let's get on with the actual award. As I said before, it's been a fierce competition this year, and with more than 5,000 entries, it was quite the task for our three judges to cut them down to just three. But our three finalists definitely deserve to be here, and without further ado, I would like to... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You'll hear two students talking about different aspects of their university. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Great party last night. You should have come. But anyway, so what have we got to do here? We are supposed to fill this form in by ourselves, but I'm sure it's okay if we chat about it first, don't you think? Yeah, sure. So, there are 10 questions and we've got to tick numbers 1 to 5 for each question. 5 means really good. 1 is bad. Question number 1. Was the course well organized? We'll give that a 5, agree? Yep. No question about that. What does question 2 mean, though? Was the teacher flexible? Is it good to be flexible? Well, that means, was the teacher very strict? Or maybe she gave you more time to complete your assignment. Things like that. So for that question, we should give her a 5. She always gave us an extra day, didn't she? And she wanted to know our opinions on things. We had great discussions. Fair enough. What about this one? Was the teacher friendly and encouraging? I'm not sure about that. She was friendly to some students, but I think she had a problem with Mike and Alex, who were usually late. She did get a bit irritated with them sometimes. Yeah, we weren't too happy about them either, though. I know it was a bit early, with classes starting at 8.30, but you choose if you want to sign up to them or not, so that's no excuse, really. Yeah, they could have taken the evening classes if they didn't want to wake up early in the morning. Now, what about these questions on the course books? Look, the business studies book was interesting, but I thought the human behavior one was boring. Really? That's the one I liked the most, perhaps because I want to study psychology. You want to become master of the universe, managing a huge multinational company, don't you? There's nothing wrong with being ambitious, you know. The best laid plans of mice and men. What's that? Some sort of quote? Stop being so literary. Let's get on with question five. Did you find the campus library a useful resource? Well, most of the books I wanted had already been taken out. But the internet access was definitely useful. Let's give that a four. Okay, and the staff there were always friendly and helpful. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Now, what's this? You know, they keep going on at us about how we don't use the off-campus library enough. I suppose this question is to test if we know where things are there. So, here's a plan of the library. You use it more than me. I've only been there once, actually. You tell me. Right. So as you go in, the librarian's desk is on your right. Directly opposite is the section for new publications, new books the college has acquired. Some of them are actually written by our own teachers, interestingly enough. Then there's lots of seating and the computers. Behind that, we've got the periodicals, newspapers and magazines. And that's before the reference section, you know, with the books you can't take out. Dictionaries and encyclopedias? That sort of stuff. Now, I do know where the management section is. It's right at the end on the left, isn't it? Just before the stairs up to the lecture theater. Uh, no. Sorry. Management and business studies, along with marketing, are all, as you said, at the back, but on the right. Oh, 
So what's on the left then? That's the fiction section or literature. Now, if you want to photocopy something, where do you go? I think I remember. Isn't it one of the rooms after the entrance on the right? Yeah. It's between the multimedia room and the seminar room. They're all behind the librarian's desk. What about the toilets? For those, you have to go downstairs. That's where the computer studies section is, too, for some reason. Let's get on with the next question. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear a talk on the history of football in Great Britain in the 19th century. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Great Britain is often hailed as the home of football, with talented players travelling from far and wide to play for teams in the English Premier League, one of the most popular football leagues on the planet. Today we are going to take a look back to the 19th century Great Britain in an attempt to trace the evolution of the beautiful game as it is now known. Prior to the 19th century, the game featured a wide variety of local and regional adaptations, which were later smartened up and made more uniform to create our modern-day sports of association football, rugby football, and Ireland's Gaelic football. Even up to the mid-19th century, Shrovetide football, or mob football, was still widely practised. According to the rules of mob football, there were no rules. A player could legally use any means whatsoever to obtain the ball, such as kicking, punching, biting and gouging, with the only exceptions being murder and manslaughter. These games may be regarded as the ancestors of modern codes of football, and by comparison with later models of football, they were chaotic and had few cooperation. Towards the latter end of the 19th century and moving into the early part of the 20th century, however, there appeared a newfound emphasis on moral values in football. Perhaps a more modern example of this can be seen in John Terry's suspension as England captain, following reports of his infidelity to his wife. Furthermore, as mob football died away, there grew a greater concern for players' health and general well-being, with many clubs affording their top players access to frequent medical checkups and treatment. Despite the presence of Great Britain's unique, state-funded National Health Service, football clubs are still seen today, providing team members with state-of-the-art healthcare facilities, with the top clubs even housing their own specialist doctors and physicians. Today, football is a key feature of school children's day-to-day -day education, particularly for boys. With the help of football associations, all schools in the UK are boasting their own football teams. This mainly comes as a result of pressure put on schools and the government by concerned parents, who felt that football education taught their children valuable lessons and indeed vital life skills, such as teamwork and a drive to succeed.
Nowadays, many of the UK's top football clubs provide training facilities and outreach programmes in an attempt to educate the nation's aspiring youths. As I previously mentioned, it was only during the 19th century that football in its uniform concept truly began to emerge. With footballers previously playing according to their own versions of the rules. However, it was not until the early 20th century that different players actually began to play according to these standardized rules. Prior to the 19th century, football was played by all the major English public schools, including the likes of Eton College, Winchester College, and Harrow. In 1848, there was a meeting at Cambridge University in an attempt to lay down the laws of football. Present at the meeting were representatives of each of these major public schools, whom each brought a copy of the rules enforced by their own individual school's rules of football. The result of the meeting was what is now known as the Cambridge Rules, thereby uniting the rules from across the country into one simple document. However, the Cambridge Rules were not liked by all, and a new set of rules, Thring's Rules, compounded in the book The Simplest Game, became commonplace among dissenters. Across the country, improvements in infrastructure and public transport had a knock-on effect of dramatically increasing attendance to football games. Football quickly became a social event where spectators would meet friends, drink tea and chat about the good old days. As football became more and more popular, it was decided that more money should be invested in maintaining the quality of pitches amongst other things and there was even talk of installing seating for spectators. However, the question of who was to foot the bill quickly became a divisive issue, with many believing that the government should fund football's development as a national sport. But in the end, the onus fell upon Britain's local and regional football clubs for the funding and development of the Football Association. They became responsible for the upkeep of football grounds, began to pay their best players a small salary, and organised competitions against other local and regional teams. And there began England's Football Association, or the FA, as we know it in its current form, the governing body of football in England. As the FA continued to grow and accumulate greater wealth, it was able to attract more and more talented young men from across the country, before finally accepting professional talent in the early 20th century. Today, football is played at a professional level all over the world. Millions of people regularly go to football stadiums to follow their favourite teams, while billions more watch the game on television or on the internet. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test and speaking, you cut guesswork. Please guys participate in everyday new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material, visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com. The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material, then please join my Telegram channel. So guys, please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.